Hey guys, if you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's simply the easiest way to make a podcast. Anchor by Spotify has everything you need all in one place. So let me explain. Now, Anchor has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own cell phone or your own computer. Now, I've been using and loving Anchor by Spotify for two years now. And don't forget that Anchor will go ahead and distribute your podcast on so many listening platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and so many, many more. Now, I think it's simply everything you need to make your own podcast all in one place. And don't forget, Anchor is totally free. So why don't you go ahead and download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I can't wait to hear all of your podcasts. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to all my listeners. Now, I hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thank you so much and welcome. Welcome to episode number eight of my seventh season. Today is Wednesday, October 26th, 2022. My name is Sonal Patel, and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now, all right, you guys, I'm back from Paris. Ha ha ha. Not that one, but this one. I got my educational fix. All of my networking goals achieved. I revisited with old friends, and I steered my career with my next chapter goals in mind. Now, the highlight was hearing that 2024 may see this particular conference in Hawaii. So, oh my goodness, I'm so excited and I know I will be there in 2024. So, fingers crossed, it will be in Hawaii. Now, I left midweek here in the Midwest, colder temps in the 30s or so, and definite snowflakes were falling on Monday of last week. But I did come back on Saturday at the crack of dawn, and I came back to ridiculously beautiful, fierce, fiery oranges and reds, all the fall trees aglow, and the temperatures to match as well. They were in the 70s, and they still are as I record this episode with tons of Midwest wind as well. Lots of wind. Anyway, I'm also happily sipping on my pumpkin spice latte as I record this episode, watching the orange and red leaves fly in the wind. So I'm very happy here as I record. Now, of course, I also came back on Saturday morning to get a little package, another little package. They love to break it up into multiple boxes from the AAPC. I did get that shiny new CPT 2023 coding manual with the tiny little ENM companion guide for the first time. I love it because we do have to learn about all of those new 2023 revisions to the 2021 ENM guidelines. So can't wait to dive in. Now, all right, you guys, I've got a lot to get into today. So of course, I'm gonna be diving into my compliance tips and my recommendations today on my back to basics for remittance advice codes for Medicare. And hey, hey, you know, it's my month end episode where I discuss highlights from the month of October's criminal and civil enforcement cases involving fraud, waste, and abuse. And I go ahead and round out today's episode with a remarkable quote on purpose and impact by Dostoevsky. If you checked me out on LinkedIn, You know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and our valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organization, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture If you like what you're hearing, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. Before the new year, I would love to see my five stars increase from 19 all the way up to 50. So I'm really hoping all of you guys will send me some love and drop me those five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts. I'd really appreciate it. 
Now, as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I'm bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and my recommendations based on my over 12 years of experience in front office, in back end, in coding, and in billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into Newsworthy, the month's fraud, waste, and abuse cases. The month of October saw 28 cases as of the recording of this episode. Early October saw a pediatric dentist and affiliated practices to pay over $750,000 to resolve False Claims Act allegations. Now, specifics include that the pediatric dentist and affiliated practices allegedly performed and billed for medically unnecessary therapeutic pulpotomies on pediatric patients. The settlement also resolves allegations that they provided inaccurate servicing provider information on claims submitted to Medicaid managed care organizations during the years 2011 through 2014. And according to the United States, certain dentists performed therapeutic pulpotomies on primary teeth even though there was no dental decay in the inner third of the dentin during the years 2011 through 2018. Early October also saw a business owner sentenced to 30 months and ordered to repay $7.5 million for a health care fraud scheme. This man admitted owning or operating three companies that supplied orthotic braces and other durable medical equipment, or DME. He allegedly contracted with marketing firms who placed ads on television and online that offered orthotic braces at no cost. The companies sent patient information to a telemedicine doctor who allegedly signed an order for medical equipment without evaluating or even communicating with the patient in some cases. Those leads consisting of the patient information and the medical equipment order were then sold to this business owner's DME companies. He admitted paying 70% to 80% of his profits to one person who supplied leads to one out of those three DME companies. He also admitted another DME company received $35 to $40 for leads without a doctor's order and $280 to $300 for a full lead. Even after one of the three DME companies was suspended for paying illegal kickbacks, the business owner's office manager and another man who ran the day-to-day operations opened up new DME companies. Allegedly, the kickbacks continued for referrals and leads at these new DME companies as well. Mid-October saw a California health care services provider and medical center agreeing to pay over $13 million to settle False Claims Act allegations of improper billing for lab tests. Here, the United States contends that this healthcare services provider and medical center submitted bills or caused bills to be submitted for reimbursement of the qualitative and quantitative testing it performed on urine toxicology specimens. The United States asserts that they did not perform the quantitative testing on thousands of specimens referred under the agreement and that these quantitative tests were instead performed by third-party labs. The United States alleges that they nevertheless sought reimbursement for the tests. In the settlement agreement, the United States contends that between August 1, 2016 and June 30, 2017, They billed for urine toxicology tests it did not perform and was paid for the testing by the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, Medicare, Medicaid, and TRICARE. Mid-October also saw the United States file a civil fraud lawsuit against Cigna for artificially inflating its Medicare Advantage payments. Here, the lawsuit seeks damages and penalties under the False Claims Act for Cigna's submissions to the government 
of false and invalid patient diagnosis codes to artificially inflate the payments Cigna received for providing insurance coverage to its Medicare Advantage plan members. The government's complaint alleges that the reported diagnosis codes were based solely on forms completed by vendors, retained and paid by Cigna to conduct in-home assessments of plan members. The healthcare providers, typically nurse practitioners, who conducted these home visits did not perform or order the testing or imaging that would have been necessary to reliably diagnose the serious, complex conditions reported and were prohibited by Cigna from providing any treatment during the home visit for the medical conditions they purportedly found. The diagnoses at issue were not supported by the information documented on the form completed by the vendor and were not reported to Cigna by any other healthcare provider who saw the patient during the year in which the home visit occurred. Nevertheless, Cigna submitted these diagnoses to the government to claim increased payments and falsely certified on an annual basis that its diagnosis data submissions were, quote, accurate, complete, and truthful, end quote. The U.S. attorney on the case stated, quote, as alleged, Cigna obtained tens of millions of dollars in Medicare funding by submitting to the government false and invalid diagnoses for its Medicare Advantage plan members. Cigna knew that, under the Medicare Advantage reimbursement system, it would be paid more if its plan members appeared to be sicker. This office is dedicated to holding insurers accountable if they seek to manipulate the system and boost their profits by submitting false information to the government, end quote. Mid-October also saw four pharmacies pay over $6.8 million to settle civil claims for waiving co-pays, charging the government higher prices than permitted, and trading federal health care business with other pharmacies. These pharmacies allegedly created a copay waiver program where patients would have their copays waived based on a brief, unverified statement of economic need. These pharmacies also misled the government programs about the price being charged to uninsured cash paying patients by falsely stating that the price was high when in fact it was only $30. As a result, there were days that veterans were charged $600 or more dollars for pain creams, while uninsured patients were charged only $30. Eventually, various auditors uncovered these problems and began to terminate the pharmacies from their networks. The government alleges that one of the pharmacies was looking for a way to continue to earn money, so it began selling its now out-of-network prescriptions to other pharmacies. The other pharmacies could fill the prescriptions because they were still in network. After filling the lucrative prescriptions, the other pharmacies remitted a portion of the proceeds to that newly out-of-network pharmacy. The government alleges that this arrangement constituted an illegal kickback. There are three other pharmacies that allegedly participated in this prescriptions for money scheme. Of course, there were also many, many of the other usual suspects, like more opioids distributors, overprescribing, more kickbacks, more bribery schemes, more elder abuse cases, even more DME fraud, and money laundering. But I wanted to pay particular attention to a case involving a COVID-19 fraud scheme. Here, an adult day health provider resolves allegations of overbilling for COVID-19 payments. This adult day health provider will pay over $300,000 to resolve allegations that it improperly billed the state's Medicaid program for COVID-19 emergency-related retainer payments intended to support adult day health facilities, or ADH, facilities from April 1, 2020 through July 31, 2020. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, this particular state's Medicaid program issued additional rate provisions to help ensure that this ADH center did not go out of business, nor did any of the ADH centers go out of business. 
in the state. The Attorney General's office alleges that this ADH provider submitted claims at a much higher frequency than it was allowed under those rate provisions. ADH centers were eligible to receive retainer payments equal to the full amount of the per diem rates per each state Medicaid plan member for, quote, each day in which that member would have been scheduled to attend, end quote, the ADH center. Now, an investigation by the Attorney General's Medicaid Fraud Division found that this ADH provider billed for retainer payments for members at a much higher frequency than the member had been scheduled to attend the ADH center prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is in violation of the state Medicaid plan rate provisions. This ADH also billed the state Medicaid program for services to members who were receiving care in inpatient or nursing home settings, not from the ADH. All right. Wow. So this COVID-19 this COVID fraud scheme is definitely not isolated, right? The early days of the pandemic in 2020 saw many states providing so much leeway and latitude for COVID-19 billing. But despite the generosity to our most underserved populations, like this case highlights, right, there are still those individuals who will take advantage. Like the attorney general on this case stated, quote, this provider cheated the system by taking advantage of retainer payments intended to keep facilities in business during the pandemic, end quote. And finally, as Breast Cancer Awareness Month comes to a close next Tuesday, we need to remember it's all about community. Having a strong support system is a powerful force for healing and recovery. The National Breast Cancer Foundation celebrates the impact of community and the importance of having a network of supporters along each step of the breast cancer journey. Because we are so much stronger together. So share a word of wisdom or encouragement with someone you know on their breast cancer journey. Stay in touch with them as often as you can to show your support and your encouragement. Write a card, send messages or shout outs of thanks to those that helped you along your entire breast care cancer journey. There is power in community. You can always donate whatever you can to help support key areas of support identified by the National Breast Cancer Foundation, including providing mammograms to those in need, patient navigation services for those in treatment, and support group meetings where patients and survivors can find strength and encouragement from others who are on the same journey. And now it's time for my best practice tips in trusty tip. So in today's compliance tip and my back to basics recommendations, I wanted to focus on remittance advice codes for Medicare. You know, that's that fine print on your EOBs or your explanation of benefits, also known as your remittance advice from Medicare that contains the rationale for why the service may have been adjusted or denied, or any number of other things I want to go over. Now, this information can be found in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 22, Remittance Advice. Now, I specifically want to go over Section 60 for Remittance Advice Codes. Here, it states, quote, the term adjustment may mean any of the following. Denied, zero payment, partial payment, reduced payment, penalty applied, additional payment, supplemental payment. Now, it goes on to state that group codes, claim adjustment reason codes, and remittance advice remark codes are used to explain adjustments at the claim or service line level. Provider level adjustment, or PLB reason codes, are used to explain any adjustment at the provider level, end quote. Now, moving on, in section 60.1, that's titled group codes, it states, quote, a group code 
is a code identifying the general category of payment adjustment. A group code must always be used in conjunction with the claim adjustment reason code to show liability for amounts not covered by Medicare for a claim or service. MACs do not have discretion to omit appropriate codes and messages. MACs must use appropriate group, claim adjustment reason, and remittance advice remark codes to communicate clearly why an amount is not covered by Medicare and who is financially responsible for that amount. Valid group codes for use on Medicare remittance advice include CO for contractual obligations. This group code shall be used when a contractual agreement between the payer and payee or a regulatory requirement resulted in an adjustment. Generally, these adjustments are considered a write-off for the provider and are not billed to the patient. Then there's also OA for other adjustments. This group code shall be used when no other group code applies to the adjustment. And finally, there is PR or patient responsibility. This group code shall be used when the adjustment represents an amount that may be billed to the patient or the insured. This group would typically be used for deductible and copay adjustments, end quote. Then let's go over section 60.2, which is titled Claim Adjustment Reason Codes. Here it states, quote, Claim Adjustment Reason Codes, or CARCs, are used on the Medicare electronic and paper remitt remittance advice as well as the Coordination of Benefit, or COB, claim transactions. The Claim Adjustment Status and Reason Code Maintenance Committee maintains this code set. A new code may not be added, and the indicated wording may not be modified without the approval of this committee. These codes were developed for use by all U.S. health payers. As a result, they are generic, and there are a number of codes that do not apply to Medicare. This code set is updated three times a year. Max shall use only the most current valid codes in ERA, SPR, and COB claim transactions, end quote. And then let's move on to section 60.3, which is titled Remittance Advice Remark Codes. It states, quote, Remittance Advice Remark Codes, or RARCs, are used in a remittance advice to further explain an adjustment or relay informational messages that cannot be expressed with the Claim Adjustment Reason Code. Remark codes are maintained by CMS, but may be used by any health plan when they apply. Max must report appropriate remark codes that apply. There is another type of remark code that does not add supplemental explanation for a specific adjustment, but provides general adjudication information. These informational remark codes start with the word alert and can be reported without group and claim adjustment reason code. An example of an informational RARC would be, quote, MA01, alert. If you do not agree with what we approved for these services, you may appeal our decision. To make sure that we are fair to you, we require another individual that did not process your initial claim to conduct the appeal. However, in order to be eligible for an appeal, you must write to us within 120 days of the date you received this notice unless you have good reason for being late. End quote. Then, it goes on to further state, quote, the remark code list is updated three times a year and the list is posted at the WPC website and gets updated at the same time when the reason code list is updated. Both code lists are updated on or around March 1st, July 1st, and November 1st. Max must use the latest approved remark codes as included in the recurring code update CR or any other CMS instruction or downloading the list from the WPC website after each update. 
Mac and shared system changes must be made as necessary as part of a routine release to reflect changes such as retirement of previously used codes or newly created codes that may impact Medicare, end quote. So I think it's always beneficial to save and scan all pieces, parts, all pages of those EOBs, those remittance advice details, right? I cannot stress how many times I've had to go back to the provider's team to request more information. I cannot help anyone get a handle on what the payer is communicating without the details that follow those codes for CO, OA, PR, MA01. For example, some payers in your matrix may itemize all of the adjustment and remark codes at the end of a very lengthy, for example, 17-page electronic remittance advice, your ERA, alongside your electronic fund transfer, your EFT. When service lines are denied, those little details are actually big details that are needed to possibly appeal or refile corrected claims, etc., right, within a certain time frame that the payer discloses in the remittance or EOB or in your contract with the payer. And finally, I focus Season 7 Spark on purpose and impact. I want this seventh season spark to be filled with our world's thought leaders, writers, artists, philosophers, everyone who inspires the need for purpose and impact in all we strive to do. So in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky. The mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Absolutely true, right? I think this is an amazing quote that reminds us that we need to find our own purpose. What is it we are longing for? What are we trying to achieve? What message is being heard? Who is affected by our purpose? I think this quote reminds us that when we identify our own purpose, that is when we can make our greatest impact. We make our greatest impact not only for ourselves, from within, from that spark that glows within, but our impact then affects others. Our impact, our spark can be ignited into a flame in others as well. I'm happy Dostoevsky's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. And as always, I appreciate you all diving into today with me. If you want more information from me, please go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. And of course, please don't forget that Business of Healthcare Colloquium hosted by my good friend, Kimberly Jolivet Williams, is going to be taking place virtually on November 12th through 13th. So I really do hope you guys can sign up and attend. It's going to be full of really, really good educational information, as well as numerous other industry leaders will be speaking. Terry Fletcher, Rosemeen Bapath, Jennifer McNamara, Betty Hovey, Christine Hall, and so many other incredible professionals. I can't wait to meet them as well. So you guys, please have an amazing week ahead and... I know you're going to try and carve out that time for yourselves. In my final note today, remember that Halloween is just around the corner, right? So get dolled up and go out for your own tricks and treats. You can carve out time yourself that way. And don't forget, as you're carving out those pumpkins, remember that's the time. Again, you can also carve out for yourselves. You're not thinking about those everyday stresses of your life and of your job and of your commitments and whatever it is that weighs heavy on you. I'm dying to see that Halloween ends movie. I hope I get to squeeze it into my weekend. I love Mike Myers. I think that's his name. He totally scared me for two decades now, right? I think that movie's been going on for forever. I think as the title says, Halloween ends. I'm hoping it'll finally end. Um, But anyway, you guys, another final note is I definitely have to get my flu shot. It's already the end of October here and I need that flu shot. 
and my booster for COVID-19. I thought I was going to get that over the weekend, but they didn't have my Moderna. So I'm going to get that within these next few days. I have an appointment. So happy, happy, joy, joy. I'm going to get my booster for the bivalent. Anyway, you guys, please continue staying safe and healthy wherever you are as well, because flu season is definitely upon us. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.